Good afternoon, and welcome to our first book sandwiched in presentation for 2021. I'm Barbara Cook, co-chair with Louise Richardson of the BSI series. Our series this year will be very different as we adjust to our new COVID-19 environment. We will have six Zoom meetings and you may sign up to receive the Zoom link for as many as you wish on the Corning Library website, www.ssclibrary.org. Bookmarks are available at the library with the schedule and website address for signups for the remaining reviews. During each BSI presentation, Louise will act as moderator of comments that you may submit via the Zoom chat function. And this presentation is being recorded for YouTube. In addition, next week, the Friends of the Library will have their annual meeting via Zoom immediately following the BSI presentation. Please plan to stay and attend as we need to have a quorum to conduct business. If you have a question or comment after the presentation, use the chat function for Louise, which is found at the bottom of the screen and you will be recognized and able to speak. All participants will be muted for the presentation and will be unmuted by the host once Louise recognizes your question. As this is new for all of us, please be patient and enjoy the review. Our speaker today is Jenny Monroe, a longtime Corning area resident. Jenny has held executive positions with the Rockwell Museum, the Clemens Center, and Watson Homestead, the latter as the Rhodes Scholar Coordinator. She is now happily retired and able to enjoy sharing her knowledge and love for Iroquois cultural stories, which she has gathered for over 25 years. Jenny is a perfect reviewer of today's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants by Robin Ball Kimmerer. Welcome, Jenny, to Book Sandwiched In. Thank you, Barbara. I am grateful to be asked to return to Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass after first reading this book when it was published in 2013. Having now retired after spending 40 years teaching about the Finger Lakes indigenous cultures and taking out of towners into the woods. 45 years ago, Steve and I settled in Corning only a short distance from where my grandmother was born and raised on her parents' dairy farm in the far northwestern corner of Steuben County. In my role as educator at the then new Rockwell Museum, I needed a fast track introduction to Iroquois culture in order to design a respectful school program in the museum education era of the federal legislation known as NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Repatriation Creation Act. I traversed the state visiting other museums and powwows to collect artists and presenters and to purchase many hands-on artifacts for the museum programs. Many of those I sought came to be treasured friends and teachers for me and for all the audiences I created for them. This work also continued at Watson Homestead for the Rhodes Scholar groups that I led there. Robin Wall Kimmerer's book is just such a generous teacher as each essay has been woven with a foundation of traditional native story to which she adds a scientist's perspective on the characteristics of plants, all within uh, the telling of a personal narrative as a professor or as a mother or as a spiritual practitioner. Each chapter is a braid that results in a more orderly and a deeper understanding of the interaction between humans and the natural world. 
The book itself is dense, just shy of 400 pages, divided into five sections, each reflecting an aspect of the cycle. The circle of planting sweetgrass, tending sweetgrass, braiding sweetgrass, burning sweetgrass, and finally returning the gift. You might ask, and what is sweetgrass? This is a sweetgrass braid that I am happy to be able to show you. Look how beautiful and shiny it is. It's very old and dried, but yet it's still that beautiful green color. Here are three sweetgrass baskets from my collection. This is a traditional Mohawk white ash basket. You can see like those Easter baskets you used to make as a child out of construction paper. And this beautiful decoration is sweetgrass. You see that green color again. Here's another one. And I have recently refurbished this one, giving it a strawberry on the top. And you can see, this is a hundred year old basket. And you can see how beautiful the inside is, which hasn't faded like the outside did, but uh, with dyed white ash splints. And then my third basket, is a beautiful, has a beautiful sweet grass braid on it. And this is a strawberry basket, traditional uh, Mohawk design. Can you see how this is strawberry? But Kimmerer calls the sweet smelling flowing hair of Mother Earth, and it does smell sweet. It retains that lovely smell. Here's a sense memory for you, because I know you can't smell it. I would pass it around. The smell of a newly washed child's head. You know what I mean? You know that our smell evokes our strongest memories of all of our senses. For me, it's the smell of my grandmother's sewing basket, this little one. Probably one that she bought as a child visiting the Iroquois Indian market, which was every year at the New York State Fair in Syracuse. To braid is to make orderly and to strengthen, to weave three strands. For Kimmerer, the strands are science, spirit, and story, bringing them together in service of what matters most. A braid holds the tension between the strands. To braid someone's hair is to care for them and to illustrate your love. It was difficult for me to get through the book quickly, even on a second read, as I wanted to take notes on so many things. I recommend that you buy the book <laughs> and read one essay every day for a month. I believe you will grow new eyes and feel a deeply quieting, quieting sense of gratitude about the abundance place in which we live. That is, until the end of the book, when you might be drawn into the disquiet of feeling an itch that needs scratching as she skillfully brings us right up close to environmental degradation and asks us what we're gonna do with those feelings of despair. Self-described on the cover, Robin Will Wall Kimmerer is a mother, a botanist, a decorated professor, and an enrolled member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. Her first book, Gathering Moss, was awarded the John Burroughs Medal for Outstanding Nature Writing. Her writings have appeared in Orion, O Magazine, and numerous scientific journals. She lives in Fabius, New York, where she is SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor of Environmental Biology and the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. This, her second book, is both a New York Times and a Washington Post bestseller. It is named a best essay collection of the decade by Literary Hub. Here's the Library of Congress's summary description. As a leading researcher in the field of biology, Robin Will Kimmerer understands the delicate state of our world. But as an active member of the Potawatomi Nation, she senses and relates to the world through a way of knowing far older than any science. In braiding sweetgrass, she intertwines these two modes of awareness, an analytical and the emotional, the scientific and the cultural. 
to ultimately reveal a path towards healing the rift that grows between people and nature. This, these woven essays constructed in this book bring people back into conversation with all that is green and growing, a universe that never stopped speaking to us, even when we forgot how to listen. I recommend this book to you with great appreciation to the author for having written it. Have you ever had to answer a question, a child's question about how the universe works or why and found that you chose to use an analogy to do so? Many traditional indigenous explanations work that way. For example, why does smoke go up when most everything else is affected by gravity and goes down? We would use physical science principles to explain this. Hot air rises and takes up with it any unburned particulates. Native storytellers might say that smoke can contain the prayers of human beings, that creator draws up to the sky world so that these prayers can be known, which is correct. Do we have to choose one over the other or could they both be true? Since we're so fortunate to live in this beautiful part of our country, a part where the, a vivacious indigenous culture still lives and shares out of the bounty of their original land base, let's dive right in and see how the Kimmerer, see how Kimmerer braids sweetgrass. Let's start at the very beginning, at the Haudenosaunee story of creation. Some of you may know about Sky Woman, a pregnant female deity who fell from the sky world with just a handful of plants and roots that she was able to grab. She fell through the sky into a dark world and a watery abyss. Geese flew up to rescue her and brought her down and broke her fall and were able to place her gently on the back of a turtle. The only place where she would not drown. Water animals came to her and at her request brought up mud from the deep ocean. Sky Woman spread this mud across the shell so that she could plant the seeds that she had brought with her. In her delight, she danced a counterclockwise circle around the turtle shell and it expanded as a reflection of her gratitude and the turtle's pride in being able to save this strange creature from the sky. Their combined actions created Turtle Island, where you and I live today. Creation stories of indigenous peoples lay down basic cultural norms. Here we have a woman as the star of what would become a matriarchal culture, planting seeds and being grateful. Braiding Sweetgrass begins with this story of how plants became not just food, but medicine and relatives. The author contrasts Turtle Island with the Christian Garden of Eden, both abundant, yes, but in one, all life forms are considered relations. And in the other, anything non-human becomes an it and is relegated to be subservient to humankind. Contrast the roles of these two women, Eve and Sky Woman one the heroine and the other the transgressor. Rather than stay in the, Adam, in the garden, Adam and Eve are banished as exiles to feed themselves from the sweat of their brows. The garden becomes something that must be subdued, called unimproved land in today's real estate lingo. The author and the professor asks her third year college students on their way to careers in environmental protection to rate their knowledge of positive interactions between people and the land. Their median response was none. Let me read a little from the book to you. I was stunned. How is it possible that in 20 years of education, they cannot think of any beneficial relationships between people and the environment? Perhaps the negative examples they see every day, brownfields, to, oh, not farms, suburban sprawl, truncated their ability to see some good between humans and the earth. 
as the land becomes yeah, impoverished, yeah. so too does the scope of their vision. When we talked about this after class, I realized that they could not even imagine that what beneficial relationships between their species and others might look like. How can we begin to move towards ecological and cultural sustainability if we cannot even imagine what that path feels like? If we can't imagine the generosity of, greed, of geese, these students were not raised on the story of Sky Woman. And now the descendants of Sky Woman and Eve meet and the land around us bears the scar. Indigenous stories often relay original instructions. That is, the way we were meant to be as people, a compass or a map for living. But it is not transcendent because it needs to be renewed yeah. in each generation. The author asks, it's a have we been cast out? Have we cast out these original instructions? Have we worn out our welcome originally offered by an abundant Mother Earth? Other species have always been the lifeboat for humans. Now we must be theirs. The maternal image of the pregnant sky woman reminds us that to be indigenous means to live as if your grandchildren's future matters, to take care of the land as we take care of our children as if both our lives, material and spiritual, depend on it, because they do. In the Western tradition, there is a recognized hierarchy of beings with, of course, the human being at the top, pinnacle of evolution, the darling of creation, and the plants at the bottom. But in native ways of knowing, Human people are often referred to as the younger brothers of creation. We say that humans have the least experience with how to live and thus the most to learn. We must look to our teachers among the other species for guidance. Their wisdom is apparent in the way they live. They teach us by example. They've been on earth far longer than we have been and have had time to figure things out. They live both above and below ground, joining sky world and to the earth. Plants know how to make food and medicine from light and water, and they give it away. Here I must set the book down. There are so many stories I want you to explore. Like, why do all the pecan trees in a grove bear nuts over abundantly in one year and then not at all in the next? Is there communication between individual tree beings? Was the Indian Removal Act and the Indian boarding school movement two prongs of the same mission? Why is it that native people have a different idea about the ownership of land? Did you know that the constitution only protects the land rights of land owners? The trees say that all flourishing is mutual. Each of those is one of the chapters that you're going to read in Braiding Sweetgrass. One of my favorites was called The Gift of the Strawberry. I trust that each of you have tasted a ripe wild strawberry it's the sacred fruit of the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse, or the Iroquois, as they have been come, come to know. It calls us, and it comes to us freely given from Mother Earth. Here, we must return to that creation story. Remember the pregnant sky woman? Well, her time finally came and she gave birth on Turtle Island to a beautiful baby girl who grew up to be a young woman and one night was impregnated by the west wind who left his mark, two crossed arrows on the young woman's body. The pregnancy was quick and quite scary. Remember how quickly storms can come up from the west? And Sky Woman knew that her daughter was pregnant and with twins. 
One twin was impatient to be first and cut a hole through his mother's side to get out. Now a grandmother, Sky Woman watched her daughter while still in labor bleed to death after the other twin was born in the normal way. She buried her daughter's body and visited the grave daily to report on the progress of the boys. The first is called the bad twin and the second born the good twin. Over the weeks, Sky Woman noticed five plants growing from her daughter's burial mound that she did not recognize. The three sisters of corn, beans, and squash grew interdependently, tall sister corn stalks supporting trellising sister beans with sister it's squash a as a ground cover. Next, she noticed a tall, fuzzy, broadleaf plant with bright pink trumpet flowers growing from where her daughter's head would be. It was the sacred tobacco. You can hear her though. Representation of the good mind, the smoke filled connection between humans and creator. Last to bloom were the tiny white flowers that give way to hard little ground berries. So unique because their seeds are all on the outside of the fruit. It is called the strawberry. And it is such important medicine that it warrants a ceremony upon its arrival. The white blossoms alert you that there will be no more white stuff covering the ground so you can begin the work in your garden without the danger of frost. The sweet smell of strawberry juice is the fragrance of the spirit world because there streams do not flow water but strawberry juice. And the berry shape, just like that of a human heart represent the good heart, our compassionate connection between human and earth. And just like the strawberry, we are designed to give everything away, hoard nothing, just as the berry teaches us all with its seeds on the outside. In the old times, when people's lives were so directly tied to the land, it was easy to know the world as a gift. When fall came, the skies would darken with flocks of geese honking, here we are, here we are. It reminds the people of cre the creation story. When the geese came to save Sky Woman, the people are hungry, winter is coming and the geese fill the marshes with food. It is a gift that the people received with thanksgiving, love, and respect. But when the food does not come from a flock in the sky, you, you don't feel the warm feathers cool in your hand and know that a life has been given for yours. When there is no gratitude in return, that food may not satisfy. It may leave the spirit hungry while the belly is full. Something is broken when food comes on a styrofoam tray wrapped in slippery plastic, a carcass of being whose only chance at life was a cramped cage. This is not a gift of life. It is theft. As they grew up in their grandmother's longhouse, the twins agreed to disagree. The good twin was Lord of the Daylight and was companionable and optimistic. He was creative and he cared for all the needs of his grandmother. He made beautiful flowers and insects to pollinate them. He invented human beings and is called the creator. He fashioned rivers for canoeing, gently flowing in opposite directions at each bank. Amazing. Each day, he would return with stories of his creative adventures for his grandmother to marvel at and for his twin brother to mock. The evil twin spent all day and was awake all, slept all day and was awake all night. He could see in the dark, but he also used his incredible sense of smell to sniff out where his brother had been. He was the one who put thorns on the roses and the witch hazel. He gave the pollinators sharp mouth or tail parts to sting humans and animals. 
he gave the snake poison in its fangs. And he was the one who put a spell on those beautiful rivers, sending them down waterfalls and filling them with white water boulders and only going in one direction. One day, Sky Woman told the boys that she was ready to go to the Sky World. The good twin was saddened, but told her that he would honor her wishes and bury her next to their mother and come to visit every day. He thanked her for all that she had taught him. The evil twin could not accept his grandmother's decision and shook her by the shoulders and shouted, you can't leave me. He shook her so hard that her head separated from her body and flew up into the sky. You can see her there now, for she is known as Grandmother Moon, still diligently watching over her beloved grandchildren and all the rest of us. And she still is dancing in that counterclockwise circle around the edge of the turtle shell. Sometimes she's looking straight at us but as she dances, she moves around and we see less of her face until we don't see anything at all. But she always comes around again and her face grows as it waxes to full. How many times do we see her full in the face every year? 13 full moons. Why 13, you might say? Because she has not forgiven the original gift that turtle gave her in providing a home on his shell decorated with 13 segments. Many indigenous people have names for each of these segments on the back of a turtle, each of these 13 moons. In Haudenosaunee villages, there is the moon of the cracking trees in February, the maple sugar moon when the sap begins to flow, and the strawberry moon where the children can find ripe red berries, sometimes even by moonlight. Grandmother Moon still controls the ocean tides and supervises the flow and gestation of women of childbearing years, just as she watched over her daughter's pregnancy so many lifetimes ago. And the twins are still with us as well. You know the good twin who brings us abundance and gifts, fresh breezes, bird song, sunrises and sunsets. His brother is still here too and may be found in some people's dispositions. His work is in creating fear, chaos, rot, disunity and aggression. Thankfully their forces are matched and we humans can choose which one we will feed. But evil is lurking around every corner in dark places. And when we're not paying attention, he will make himself known. <laughs> there are so many stories and lessons in this book. I have brought up only a few. Here's just a short list of some of the takeaways I have gleaned from the book. As a human being who cannot photosynthesize, I must struggle to participate in the honorable harvest. This means take only what is offered. Never take the first, never take the last. Introduce yourself to the natural world and ask permission before you take. Leave something in return. Gratitude is a good, is a good start. Recognize your role as gardener, especially to those crops that depend on humans to cultivate them. Invest in your garden, knowing that it loves you back. Consider how global warming affects tree species who cannot move to cooler climates. Consider planting endangered tree species from warmer regions to cooler ones. For fuel, only purchase energy that is freely given. That would mean wind, geothermal, tidal, or solar power not coal or oil or natural gas or plutonium that are all ripped from inside Mother Earth. Be willing to invest for the future in more ways than just purchasing commodities. Think restorative justice for plants 
as well as for people. Remember that all is meant to be shared. Practice like the strawberry. And my favorite, rejoice that plants speak the universal language of love, food. Kimmerer has illuminated so many aspects of the richness of native understanding that are particular to our region's indigenous people, the way we're, we were originally instructed to live as people. Foundational to all of this is a sense of gratitude for the blessings of our world that flow from a recognition of each aspect of the great joy and gift of life. The Thanksgiving address, also referred to as words before all else, is a prayer that can be abbreviated as a personal daily mnemonic or recited as a day long ceremonial message by a faith keeper. But in either fashion, it begins with the intention of bringing the minds of the people together as one. Remember in school, when you said the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, imagine how your life might be, would be with the recitation of this. Here I offer a child's version of the Thanksgiving address. Greetings and thanks to each other as people. To the earth, mother of all, greetings and thanks. To all the waters, waterfalls and rains, rivers and oceans, greetings and thanks. To all fish life, greetings and thanks. To the grains, the greens, the beans and the berries, as, all we, as one, we send greetings and thanks to food plants. Medicine herbs of the world and their keepers, greetings and thanks to all the animals and, and their teachings, greetings and thanks to the tree nations for shelter and shade, fruit and beauty, greetings and thanks to all the birds, large and small, joyful greetings and thanks. For the four, from the four directions to the four winds, Thank you for purifying the air we breathe and for bringing us strength. Greetings. The thunderers, our grandfathers in the sky, we hear your voices. Greetings and thanks. And now the sun for the light of a new day and all the fires of life. And there's the strawberry. First fruits. Greetings and thanks. To our oldest grandmother, the moon, leader of women all over the world, and to the stars for their mystery, beauty, and guidance. Greetings and thanks. To our teachers from all times, reminding us of how to live in harmony. Greetings and thanks. And for all the gifts of creation, for the love that is still around us. Greetings and thanks. And for that which is forgotten, we remember. We end our words. Now our minds are one. Imagine raising children in a culture in which gratitude is the first priority. Frida Jacks works at the Onondaga Nation School. She is a clan mother, a school community liaison, and a generous teacher. She explains to me that the Thanksgiving address embodies the Onondaga relationship with the world. Each part of creation is thanked in turn for fulfilling its creator given duty to others. It reminds you every day that you have enough, she says. More than enough, everything needed to sustain life is already here. When we do this every day, it leads to an outlook of contentment and respect for all of creation. You can't listen to the Thanksgiving address without feeling wealthy. And while expressing gratitude seems innocent enough, it is a revolutionary idea. In a consumer society, contentment is a radical proposition. Recognizing abundance rather than scarcity undermines an economy that thrives by creating unmet desires. 
gratitude cultivates an ethic of fullness, but the, it's, but the economy needs emptiness. The Thanksgiving address reminds you that you have already everything you need. Gratitude doesn't send you out shopping to find satisfaction. It comes as a gift rather than a commodity, subverting the foundation of the whole economy. That's good medicine for the land and the people alike. The oratory is more than an economic model. It's a civics lesson too. Frida emphasizes that hearing the Thanksgiving address every day lifts up the models of leadership for young people. The strawberry as leader of the berries, the eagle as leader of the birds. It reminds them that much is expected of them eventually. It says that what it means to be a good leader, to have wisdom, to be generous, to sacrifice on behalf of the people. Like the maple, leaders are the first to offer their gifts. It reminds the whole community that leadership is rooted, not in power or authority, but in service and wisdom. As Frida says, the Thanksgiving address is a reminder that we cannot hear too often that we human beings are not in charge of the world, but we are subject to the same forces as all the rest of life. For me, meaning the author, the cumulative impact of the Pledge of Allegiance from my time as a schoolgirl to my adulthood was the cultivation of cynicism and a sense of the nation's hypocrisy, not the pride it was meant to instill as I grew to understand the gifts of the earth I couldn't understand how love of country could omit recognition of the actual country itself. The only promise it requires is to a flag. What of the promises to each other and to the land? I wish I had more time to read to you, but I don't. But I know many of you will get a copy of this amazing book for yourself. The author brings the book to a powerful closure with the story of Onondaga Lake. You may know that this lake is located adjacent to the city of Syracuse, and it has been an industrial dumping ground for almost 200 years, ever since the Erie Canal first brought commerce to the Salt City. Yet it is still considered sacred by the Onondaga Nation, whose federally recognized reservation you drive through on Route 81 in Nedro, just south of the city. It is the place where the prophet peacemaker and his disciple Awen Hatha combed the snakes from Atataro's hair, enabling the final fifth nation of the Iroquois Confederacy to pick up the peace and join their former enemies in a network designed to empower the good mind and the good heart referred to as the great law. It is where the great white pine tree was uprooted and all the warriors filled its cavity in the earth with their man-killing weapons. And its roots stretched out in all directions, enabling other indigenous groups to follow the white roots of peace to Onondaga, still the central fire of the Iroquois Confederacy. This happened at least 600 years ago, long before the white tide began. Today, there is a group called Noon, neighbors of the Onondaga Nation, who are working with the Onondaga to reclaim the lake, removing toxic sludge and replanting native species. It is slow going, seventh generation work, that is for your grandchildren's grandchildren. But it is worth doing. Be careful where you walk, for the faces of the yet unborn look up at us from just under the skin of Mother Earth. Reading this last section of the book reminds me of listening to Greta Thunberg, who has often said to us, stop telling me that you're sorry and get busy fixing the messes you've made. And sometimes the mess seems so overwhelmingly large that our efforts so small that you can give in to despair. Kimmerer responds, however, if despair and grief can be a doorway to love, then let us weep for the world. We are breaking apart. 
so we can love it back to wholeness again. Reading this book is a place to start. Tending and loving a garden is another. I promise you that after reading this book, maple syrup and strawberries will have a different taste. On spring evenings, you will stop and listen to the peepers and know what they are calling. Help, help, help. And you will be better prepared to help in body, mind, and spirit. Nyawe, thank you for your attention. Okay, so we have one um, question so far. Great. Uh, Bev Stevens wonders, is the Thanksgiving address actually part of the book or if not, how could she find it? It is. You'll love it. Um, it is many chapters within the book. And let me try to get rid of this. Um, feedback. This little tiny book, you'll find at many Indian museums. It's called the Thanksgiving Address. And it is available through, here is a website, SyracuseCulturalWorkers.com. I'll put it in the chat for you. It, it's, it's where I got this and also the other. Do you think it's because we have two mics on? Okay. Good. We figured that out. I can. I am looking at the chat. We're still trying to figure out some feedback problems. Um, I will put in the chat the address for the Thanksgiving address. Um, is sweetgrass still grown and where? Again, you got to get that book because she talks about not only who's growing sweetgrass and a story about uh, the Mohawk um, we, um, basket makers growing sweetgrass, how it's grown, and some students that were studying the effect of having basket makers plant sweetgrass and how it helped the sweetgrass to grow more than the um, control where they didn't plant it. So again, the science of it is here. Sweetgrass is available also. Um, you can get it sometimes, but it's one of those things that indigenous people say cannot be sold. It is not a commodity. It should be given away. So um, it's just something to keep in mind. There's a wonderful, also a wonderful chapter about the white ash and the emerald ash borer that we're seeing right now and how the uh, wonderful stands of white ash that Mohawk and uh, Tuscarora basket makers have been using for centuries are now in danger. So that's kind of a, a very contemporary. Um, can home gardeners grow it? Interesting. I don't know the answer to that specifically, but I think you'll get some information in uh, the book about it. That would be great to try to be able to grow it. It's, it grows in um, uh, kind, kind of marshy areas. So if you have a wet area, you could try it. Now I'm going to type a message to everyone about this wonderful Syracuse Cultural Workers Dot com website. If anybody else has a question, they can put it in the chat and I'll read it. Thank you all for your, for your attention. It's been really fun to revisit the stories. So all the stories I told you are ones that I had told as a teacher, but also are found in this book. So it was great fun as I read the book to remember who told me that story, how many times have I heard it, where did I hear it, and it was just a real trip down memory lane for me as well. So while Jenny's 
Jenny, can you turn? Yeah. I um, I'll mute myself. So while Jenny's um, typing that in, sorry for the feedback. Um, those of you who enjoy audio books, uh, the library system does have this on audio. Uh, it is narrated by the author, which if you listen to a lot of audio books, you'll understand is sometimes a great idea and sometimes not. She does a terrific job. And because it's a book about telling stories, listening to it, it's as if there she is in your kitchen while you're making dinner, telling you all these lovely stories of her family and um, native stories and so forth. So I highly recommend that. So somebody has, has ordered the book, that's wonderful. Um, it was quite popular right when it came out, as I mentioned, I think it was 2013, but it has gotten a big boost recently, as you might imagine. And exactly, it's one of those slow burns, but it is definitely worth reading. And she is, well, and couldn't say a local author, but she's certainly a regional author living up in Syracuse. You can go on her website too, of course, Google. <laughs> her and you can see she had a lot of speaking engagements of course before the pandemic i hope that she is able to speak again and maybe some of us can go and see her it would be great to to uh, hear a lecture by her can you imagine having her as a biology professor how exciting it would be she has great tales about her field research with her students in the field like the story of the young girl who wore high heels to class and then they went out in the marsh, <laughs> but she had a good time anyway. Oh, I better share this. There you go. There it is, finally. Okay, so uh, any more questions, comments? If you have a comment, Marshall can unmute you. Just give me a heads up in the chat. I just took a peek at some of your faces. Thanks for coming on. I think we're going to go. Remember to come back next week. Who's going to talk about next week's book? Uh, yeah, so next week's book is The Answer yeah, Is by Alex Trebek, um, which is a memoir of. Um, largely about his hosting of Jeopardy. I think people look forward to that. It'll be reviewed by Judy Cross. And a reminder that um, the Friends Annual Meeting follows next week's presentation. So we would love to have people stay for that. Thanks so much for coming and bearing with us as we did this first um, presentation virtually. and. Um,